watch things that aren't here anymore. Now it's the 50s, and here we are at Gilmore Stadium, where we can find, well, almost anything. tycoon named Earl Gilmore. Gilmore owned 58 acres between 3rd and Beverly and Fairfax, and underneath those 58 acres was a big puddle of oil, and he used that oil to really make his mark on the city of Los Angeles. Now, there really ought to be a bigger monument to this than the guy who was behind Gilmore Field, Gilmore Stadium, Gilmore Bank, Gilmore Driving, Gilmore Gasoline, the Pan Pacific Auditorium, to say nothing of the farmer's market, which is still very much here. Gilmore Stadium was not a perfect little football stadium. It was primitive and not that successful, but around the edge of the field ran an oval racetrack. And that's where Earl Gilmore struck oil again. Midgets had just started, and it was an exact copy of the Indianapolis engine, only it was half the size. Boy, that was the greatest thing that ever hit racing. But anyway, the first races I was in, I enjoyed driving so much that I never paid any attention to anything. And after the race was over, I just loaded up my car and went home, back to Santa Barbara at first. And after about the third or fourth race, uh, the fellow that paid the prize money, said, uh, I wish you'd come by after the race is over today because I have quite a bit of money sitting there waiting for you. You're never here to collect the money when the race is over. I said, I didn't even, even know I was getting paid for this. Well, I remember that being there at night and being very cold and uh, being all dressed up in a gorgeous white outfit or a summer outfit while the boyfriend went around and around and mud splattered all over you. And I was just always annoyed wondering when in the world we were going to get out of this place and go down to Palomar and dance, because that's what I thought we ought to do. Midget autos roared onto the quarter mile oval in 1934 at the bottom of the depression and provided enough spills and chills to stay alive until the post-war years when the Offenhauser cars really went big time. Los Angeles had several Chinatowns, but only one China city, and only from 1938 to 1948. It was supposed to be a sister street to Olvera Street, just catty corner across the old plaza, and it was organized by the same civic-minded developer, Christine Sterling. She wanted to pay tribute to the Chinese who built the railroads in a lot of Los Angeles with an oriental show place. There was a Chinese temple with burning incense, a rickshaw with drivers, long gowns, pigtails, coolie hats, paper lanterns, tinkling Chinese music, chopped suey, everything stereotypically Chinese, except the laundry. My dad, who was a very conservative man, was asked, and he did, wear a Chinese costume. I mean, my mother said that it was when she came over to America, that was the last American Chinese dress she wanted to wear. Because she'd come to a new country, she felt she owed it to her host country to be like them. This is the early immigrant. For show purposes, everyone wore the little hat, you know, just, just to give as much atmosphere. And it was really the exoticism that attracted. It was a tourist attraction. They had rickshaws. This was a this was a great gimmick. 
because they had these young Chinese boys just dressed like they do in China, and they had the rickshaws and hats and all that, and they would go throughout that whole block. It's all cobblestone. So you're rickety ricked all over China City. You could have a picture taken for another 25 cents. And I remember an older lady who was very good at selling gardenia. She used to run around and say, gardenia nice. And she'd say it in such a fetching way that people would give, oh, this little old lady should have, you know, we should buy something from her kind of a thing. After a number of fires, China City finally closed in 1948. And on this corner, China City is just a memory. For about 30 years, Howard Hughes was Los Angeles' number one eccentric, and he had some tough competition. What will probably be his monument is a huge plywood boondock, the world's largest airplane with the ridiculous title of Spruce Goose. On November 2nd, 1947, in Long Beach Harbor, Hughes shoved the throttles full forward and got the flying lumber yard a few feet out of the water. Then the plane went back into its cocoon, and Hughes went back into his. After Hughes died in 1976, the goose finally waddled out of hiding and squatted next to the Queen Mary, trying to be a tourist attraction. It never really got off the ground there either, and it was disassembled and shipped to an aviation museum in Oregon. But of all the things that aren't here anymore, Hughes flying boat is probably the weirdest. I mean, for one thing, the spruce goose was made of birch. community here, the one that specializes in making movies and music and malarkey. All the stars had to come from somewhere, and many people think they came from right here. Schwab's was the kind of place where Frank Sinatra could come in and read Daily Variety and nobody would ask for an autograph. This was a big place and it had anything and everything, but most of all, it was a meeting place. Scrooge was a way of life. I mean, people came for breakfast and stayed all day. Schwab's drugstore was known around the world as a place to be discovered, where everybody who wanted to be somebody had to be seen. Maybe the real reason Schwab's became so famous is that one man wrote it all down. Sid Skolsky, was that the man's name? That, uh, that was his office. He made that place his office. He, he wrote a big column, and everybody knew what was happening in the whole of L.A. from Sid Skolsky's column, which he wrote in, in Schwab's. So he made it his base of operations, and he started writing about it. And then people would read about it, and when they came to California, they would rush to Schwab's. My first trip out here, my dad took me to Schwab's, and I was so excited because I thought Lana Turner would still be right there on that stool. <laughs> and uh, I missed it. Uh, it wasn't a, uh, anything special, but I'll tell you, thousands of girls in tight sweaters did sit there hoping to get discovered. And in Hollywood, so many people wanted to be discovered that in 1956, Schwab's drugstore expanded eastward and added a coffee shop. But unfortunately, a sad day for many Angelinos came in 1983 when Schwab's drugstore closed their doors. Harriet Nelson. She was so upset when it closed that when she would come in and uh, drive by, she had to go down Sunset Boulevard, she couldn't look at it. She turned her face to the right. She got so upset. 
she said, you know, she always felt like Schwab's was Hollywood's corner. A lot of myths and legends came out of Schwab's, but the real legends lived across the street in an exotic old hotel called the Garden of Allah. It was the former home of Allah Nazimova, one of the silent film sirens who became an instant antique when talkies came in. But she fought back, building a bunch of stucco cottages around her main mansion, and voila, a hotel. Now, if Schwab's was the hangout, the Garden of Allah was the hideaway for hanky-panky. So what happened? Why did it disappear? Well, the employed actors bought homes in Beverly Hills. They didn't need hangouts and hideaways anymore. Both Schwab's and the Garden of Allah were replaced by super shopping malls. So now the sun is going down, the stars are coming out, and it's time to have a ball. But do you realize how few people have ever been to a real ball with ball gowns?